When were you born, then? When? Mm-hmm. Your birthday? September the 1st, 1921. <coughs> Excuse me. Are we going to be talking about the years that encompass World War II? Yes. All right. Tell me your name is uh, uh, Frank Dixon Highland. Everybody calls you Dick Highland. That's right. A lot of people think my name is Richard. I even know people say Richard. You know. Oh, really? But uh, typically, when in my generation, <coughs> uh, I'm Dixon is my grand- grandfather's name. I see. And, uh, you know, so I was, I was going with the name of Dixon when I was a kid. When I started school, it was shortened to Dix. The next thing you know, it was Dick. It's okay. been every other life. I wouldn't think of Dixon when I heard uh, Dick. I'd think of Richard. That's everybody did. Yeah. Now, um, you told me your birth date was September the 1st, 1921. Right. Now, where were you born? Southern Furnace. In Southern County, Ohio. Right. Okay. And now your present address is uh, Hillview. What's, what's the name of the facility? It's Hillview Retirement Center. Okay. 1610 28th Street. And what's your portion of the line? Now, before this address, what was your address? Southwest Ohio. Okay. And uh, you lived there. Now you are retired. What was your occupation? Well, uh, you, you name it, I guess I've been there and done that. <laughs> but uh, I retired from the field of education. But uh, uh, prior, to, <coughs> excuse me, prior to World War II, I, after graduating from high school, I went to Rock Ridge College for three years. And back in those days, you could go three years and get a teaching certificate. Oh, really? I did. And I taught one year. I was assigned to a third grade at the South Furnace Elementary School. And uh, then. Uh, now that building still stands. It's still standing, but right? it's, it's not a new school. school. I mean, no. it's from it. And uh, the, um, that was uh, the school year of 41 and 42, 1941 42. That's when you taught? Right. And. Uh, Following that one year, of course, uh, a lot of my buddies that I chummed around with, and the World War II was in full swing, and the draft was going full blast. And my, I, I knew that sooner or later I was going to be drafted. So, on the, uh, but prior to that, on July the 17, 1942, uh, Helen Mossbarger and I were married. Mm-hmm. And on August the 17th of 1942, I enlisted in the Navy. A month later? <laughs> did she know what you were going to do? She didn't know it. But <laughs> kind of surprised uh, there. Right. <laughs> but uh, I was very, very fortunate in the service. Uh, uh, I went to boot camp at Great Lakes, Illinois. Mm-hmm. Went through their training program. Then uh, following that uh, boot camp training, I was assigned out to tra- in training uh, Hospital course from San Diego, California. How long were you there? Uh, no, what Something like nine weeks. Those camp, those camp was like eight weeks. So right, yeah. Probably. And uh, <coughs> I got a problem with that. But uh, following the uh, the training in San Diego, I, I, I was transferred to what was the new hospital up in Oakland, California. I was known as the new hospital. Did that make you a Navy corpsman? No, 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 not Sam. Not San Diego. Oh, when I came out, yeah. When you hospital. came out of San Diego. No, I, was, I was a hospital corpsman. Okay, so then, then I was assigned to, to uh, oh, no, a naval hospital in Oakland, California mm-hmm. and to an x-ray school. I see. And I think I went through that for about nine months. Uh, Eleven months. Mm-hmm. And fortunately, my, when I got to Oakland, my wife came out and you know, spent, uh, she was with me there. And, and then uh, all, of, all of a sudden, one day I get independent orders to, <coughs> to uh, go to Whitby Island Naval Air Base up in Whitby Island, Washington. Whitby, so the Whitby, W H I D B E Y, Whitby. And uh, that's North Puget Sound. It's about uh, 
It's probably uh, midway between Vancouver, Canada, and Seattle. Now that's a Navy port, or no, it's, uh, it's a, it was a seaplane base, and <coughs> they had the, the interchange there with uh, Fleet Air Wing Four and Fleet Air Wing Eight to Kiska, Alaska. And I think I, I was there like that because yeah. Ellen came up. And she she worked in ship service, and we lived. Uh, the Navy had a hundred uh, hundred small trailers for the Navy personnel. And I, I look back on it now. I think it cost us a hundred dollars a month. No, 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 no. Twenty five dollars a month. Mm-hmm. And everything was furnished except the uh, radio, that sort of thing. Excuse me, John. <coughs> and, but the, the Navy would, re- would bring a bus up through the, up through the uh, trailer camp and pick us up. It was like the eight to five job. Oh, really? Well, did you work at a hospital there? Or no, it was, or? Well, it was a dispensary, yeah. And uh, the... Uh, I never did. I never did practice X-ray. Actually, I typically of the service, oh, right. yeah. <laughs> Navy and Army and all of them. I think you get trained for X-ray. I was, I was certified did. as an X-ray technician, but all I did was human work because I could type. So, uh, but uh, while I was there, I became a first-class pharmacist, and uh, No, but that's when I got word that uh, our oldest son, Mike, was born. Uh, December 21st, 1944. And uh, I was on duty there, and the phone rang, and, and uh, whoever was on duty in the communications office said, uh, Mr. Hyland said, you've got a telegram here from Ohio. I, I walked, I remember walking through this, this snow. Now, she, she had gone back to Ohio? She had gone back. Yeah, she stayed out there until she was six months. Close. And her dad and mother came out and took, took, went back with her. Mm-hmm. And the uh, night before, December 21st, 1944, the telegram, I remember, read that Michael Dixon arrived at such and such time and on such and such a date and everything is fine. You know. uh, so uh, of course that was a highlight of my life. And then while I was there then, while I was there at Whitby, I get independent orders. You know the independent order came uh, from Oakland, California. And you know, and when I got to Whitby, uh, there were three X-ray technicians there, and everybody, all those guys wondered who was going to be the first, who was going to be the first to go out. Go out and they want to go overseas. You know, go overseas or be assigned some other place. You know, well, they never, never did bother them. But, and uh, like I said, from then on, I did uh, yeoman work, uh, type because I could type. You know, and uh, so that was there. I think I was there eleven months. Then I get assigned to, to uh, board a ship, and uh, we, gonna, we didn't know where we were going to head when we were heading to the South Pacific. And what did the ship was it? It was a merchant ship. Merchant. But uh, we got word that uh, they were going to build a thousand bed hospital on the China coast, anticipating the invasion of Japan proper. And uh, our stop was at Nubia, New Caledonia. The 25 of us referred to as a staging area. And I think we were there about the last month. With all that equipment, waiting on a merchant ship to come and uh, take some help to, to the Philippines. What was the name of the ship? <laughs> and anyway, uh, while we were there, uh, over there on that island, I went to the company with Glenn Lennyham, who graduated from high school, and his brother, he said, I also went to the island, but we were all set to walk a movie there when we were in the last two years. 
Did you recognize them? Oh, yeah. They recognized me. <laughs> and, uh, so there, but they said, uh, when you go out and you're going to tell me, you're only going to get, get two meals a day. And he said, well, well, that's just what it is. And we had a supply officer, and uh, he said, uh, well, what if we get more supplies? And we got plenty of so I don't know if you have to see me that you were with me, so what do you want to do with this at the time? Where would we go swap? And I remember we, uh, we traded a tea for 800 pounds of beef. We screwed it off. And we traded the weapons for it. So I get the case of the horns. I know we used to sit out on the deck and the case of oranges and come out of the reaper cold and boy, it would look good. Well, the captain that was with us with it, well, he was a great bridge player. And uh, we had a chief patience on there with his name, Lee Ramage. R-A-M-A-G. His kind of thing was that he, he fought Joe Lewis twice. He was, a, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was an ex-boxer. He picked something, about six foot nine. And, uh, of course, he had, he had his quarters, but he lived in the Coast Guard and it was tied alongside the ship. And, uh, I know, I, I did wait to get up some I did I did once in a while, he puffing and blowing, you know, and that was exercise. So one of the captains came sent word down and said, he wanted, he, he wanted some bridge players. And he uh, said, uh, well, back up on the I looked up in the army after I got home. So, and he did fight Joe Lewis. He lasted four rounds with Joe Lewis in 1934. He was knocked out in the eighth round in 1934. So it's true. It was true. <laughs> some of the fellows were a little bit suspect in telling the story, but all that energy going through that side. He, he, he knew there was something about boxing. But anyway, uh, the captain said, well, he wants some bridge players. And he said, well, we're going to play some more. We put him some orange crates out there. And he said, well, I don't think. And then they're going to play for it. So much a game, quarter, quarter, center corner. But that was my introduction to bridge. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not a bridge player. But anyway, when he said, I want you to be on the bridge. I said, no, I don't, I don't, wait. I'll teach you, I'll teach you, it's okay. But I do know that, you know, part of you sitting over there, and you come down, and you, you said, you can look at three notes, and I said, that's a signal for you to come back as a longest and strongest suit to him. That means that he don't have enough to get out, he, he's telling you what his suit is. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to say, well, okay, I can back with hearts or diamonds or whatever. <laughs> We're sitting in this guy over here, and I asked him, I'm going to be coming to the I said, well, I don't have it, and I passed. And I can see that big second, and you can do that, and you can do that, and you can do that, I bid three no trump. That means you've got to tell me you're going to bid something. <laughs> <laughs> but he's one of those guys. But you know how some people are whether it's bowling or tennis, whatever they do, they can't play the time. He played the win regardless of that. But that was my introduction to the Well, anyway, we, <clears throat> there was, like I said, there were 25 of us on that island. And, uh, just 25 of us? 25 of us in that group. Like five people that equipment. And uh, I know that I was, I was on that island when uh, word came through that uh, President Franklin Roosevelt died. And I remember hearing, I was still here, and Harry Truman he took over and said, when he asked me to come to Chicago, he said, I did I just feel like the whole world's on the shoulders. Mm-hmm. And that's when he asked for the country, the people's prayers. I remember that very, very vividly. And then we got up, when we didn't get on the board ship, we traveled up to uh, the island of New Zealand in the Philippines, uh, in a community called Alangabo, uh, 
uh, right on the edge of Subic Bay. And along the pole was about 30 miles north of Manila. And while I was there, I remember uh, one day a chief said to me, he said, how'd you like to get down to Manila? I said, well, I understand that they, that they had a beautiful university there. But I, I'm sure it's not there now. But it wasn't. We went down. And the Japs had just gone over all that timber, flamethrowers, and just left us, you know. And uh, now, I, they don't call it the University of Manila now. It's just the University of the Philippines. It's going to be uh, one of the highlights, one of the high. So they did rebuild the they university. They rebuilt it, and it's the University of the Philippines. It's supposed to be a, really a high class university in, in that area. Uh, so we stayed there, and then all of us there. And the, as I said, uh, I did the open work. We had to, we had over 700 records, uh, service records, which included the CBs that were going to be in, to doing the work in that hospital. And uh, that, my responsibility was to look after all those service records, uh, like uh, keep them up to date take care of insurance records and all that sort of thing, you know. And uh, I remember uh, whenever the word came through that based upon your points that you, that you accumulated, you could go back, you were helpful to go back home. Mm-hmm. And when that came through, mine was at the top of my service record, the top mm-hmm. of the list, you know. <laughs> and uh, the, the camp, commanding officer at that time was uh, his Captain Summer. He yelled, Highland, come in here. And he said, what's this? I said, that's my service record, sir. Well, what's it doing here? I said, uh, look at the points there. He said, what did all that say? You have so many points, what, what can you do? He said, well, you can go home for discharge. I said, that's where I'm going. So he said to me, he said, well, I hate to lose you. He said, uh, if you'd agree to stay, I'll see that you would make a uh, Warrant officer. I'll make you a warrant officer. I said, well, let me. I said, I got a, I got a young guy. I haven't seen him since about two months old. I said, let me think about that. I went back and talked to the, the chief. He said, don't take me up on that. Tell me you might consider him a chief warrant. A chief warrant was the officer category, see. Mm-hmm. The, the warrant between the chief petty officer and the chief warrant. You mm-hmm. weren't an officer, you weren't a list of names, but you're still with me. But anyway, prior to that, I, I had taken the exam and made the chief pharmacy. I didn't have any of that business back then. I had a very short time. Of course, I did have, you know, I had three years of college, but uh, most, of, most of the time it said chief. I mean, I had mean, their stripes on the sleeve, you know. 15, 18, 20, 24 years. And uh, they, they were put a feeling of uh, jealousy, I guess you would say, from some of the other time when the Mustangs come through. And, and I didn't have a cheap for while I was in the But I did come home. And, uh, when did you come home? Uh, I think it was December the 5th, 1955. So you came home from the Philippines, or had yes, you go somewhere else? No, no. Well, did you go to Japan? Got a, got a, got, no, got a, got a board ship, and uh, it was a, it was a it was that, the Navy personnel, the Marine Corps personnel, the Army personnel. And we were supposed to go to the San Francisco, the embarkation. And probably three or four hundred miles out, they got a video flash and re- rerouting us to Fort Norton because of a hurricane or something so stirring up out there and it said it probably be best if we go on out to Portland. So that's where we, we, we got into Portland and I, I, we stayed there about a week before we boarded the train to come home. And uh, so it was, I, I got home to help you some of the and uh, was discharged. So I was home there to, to, for a while, and I liked a little over 20 hours getting my degree up at Rockland College. And Helen and I, and our old son Mike, I went back up there and finished that up. And then uh, when, I, when 
that to be a death, and that's when I started uh, teaching here in South Lincoln. I taught uh, social science and biology, and was a baseball coach and assistant basketball coach. And uh, the next year, I became head basketball coach, and I stayed there. Oh, let's see. I think I was there about seven years. And in the meantime, I came to the University of Tennessee and got the master's. And then I came into the city school for working with him with the uh, promise that I would, I would become an elementary principal. And uh, Mr. McKelvey, he said, Mr. McKelvey was the superintendent. He said, I don't have any I'm retiring this year, but I got three next year. He said, you're going to teach. Uh, for that one year, you know, you'll get it next year. Uh, it so happened that they started getting your tongue preparation in uh, May the 1st, 19, uh, 1953. I took a job as a training instructor to get here and remained there for 10 years. And then I left there and went to Detroit Steel. And I was there What's that to do there? At the Detroit Steel. Training record. Also training? Yeah, training record. Employee activity. We started, we started an employee activity program with the mill. We figure was very, very strong employee activity. Bowling leagues, archery leagues, whatever. And, uh, then, uh, what kind of activities at the steel mill did you do? Put golf leagues and golf leagues and uh, basketball leagues, bowling leagues, uh, women's uh, clubs, uh, whatever, just whatever they employed. If there was any interest, all they did was contact us and put it together. It was good. Providing there was enough interest. But then uh, I got caught in that takeover by Cyclops, I think in December of 70. Yeah, December of 70. But you know, in January seventy seventy one, I knew that when you had when you had to take over, you had two industrial relations, you had two uh, maintenance, you had two of this and two of that. You know, Mr. Brayshaw, Ernest Brayshaw was the president that came down from Mansfield, who was in charge. I made a point of talking to him. I said, I said, you know, I said, your job's going to be expanded as a matter of As a matter of fact, Les Blinken's office, but my immediate boss, he was going to be transferred to Detroit, and I was supposed to take his place there locally. Mm-hmm. But anyway, went on until in March. I never will forget this. In March, uh, what was that guy? Chuck Smith. They brought him in. I to, to this day, I think he was brought in for a purpose to weed him out. Maybe I should have said it like that, but I can't help it. I made a point to to him. He said the same thing, that my job was going to be expanded. And Helen and I went on vacation in July of that year, and when we came back, I got back to work, and then on Tuesday, the first week back to work, Les called me in and said, I got the toughest job I've ever had to do in my life, it's a Friday show, the last day. And he was like, yeah. And so, I didn't. So, I, actually, I, I was disappointed. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of holding around it. I thought, well, I, I could go out of town. And it just so happened when I, I did sign up for unemployment. And I signed up, and the lady looked at me, looked over my, and she left me out. And she said, you know, there's somebody in here just this week looking for somebody to put back around. And uh, I said, yes, yeah, so, is that Ms. Kirk? You know what I mean? Anyway, uh, Ed Lynn Cricker. Yes, for sure. sure. First, I was there. Yeah. But he was looking for somebody for public relations and advertising. And so I talked to him. And he made me an offer. I said, Mr. Cricker, I can't get that. I said, I said, I said, I got plenty of money. I can't kill for that money. And uh, he said, well, what would you come for? And I pointed the finger. Oh, he he, he, he said, he, uh, he was a great person, you know, for him. Somehow or other, he, he kind of took a liking to me for whatever reason. About 10 o'clock that night, I get a, I get a call from him. He said, 
Can you come to work tomorrow? She said, okay, about 30 minutes. So I was there from like, uh, yeah, 7 to, until I, would, I began there in some, in August of 71. I stayed with until so one day I was, uh, I was uh, cutting my grass out of our house. Brad Moore was down there. And he was, at that time, I was on the county board of education and the vocational board. And I thought to myself, well, I haven't got time to go with you. I haven't got grass. Anyway, we stopped talking. I, I had to say to Ray, uh, do, you have, do you have all your staff set this year? That was all that was in August. Well, he said, I got to have it. I need a principal to run the school. I don't like to have a teacher and he said he can just see himself. I said, Do you have anybody internally that's interested in that job? Ray said, Well, I got a couple of tenors in there. I really don't want to. I said, Well, go big things. So I'm not going to say it. Tell you how you react to that day. He said, You've got to be me, you know. Mm-hmm. I said, No, I'm serious. I said, I've always kept my certification up all through the year in the Superman, high school, and I'm very And I told him, said, If you're serious, we've got to work on it. Don't be in one night, and I recommend it. And uh, so uh, he said, Can you come to work with me? I said, Sure. Anyway, that's when I got started there. That's taken about nearly 10 years. Mm-hmm. What year did you start there? S- uh, school year 77. 77. Yeah. And I was there for 10 years and retired to September 1st, 1987. So that's why I spoke at a sports banquet one night. The guy in the and said, here's a guy who couldn't hold a job. But, well, after you retired from there, you, you did something else, didn't you? Didn't, weren't you on a trustee? Well, yeah, but that's just, uh, I would, see, I had to give up my elected position uh, when I went back to education. Okay. I had to give that up. I could stay on. But I stayed on as, uh, I was 24 years old, totally, in the first time. Oh, were you? I started with the faculty with the technical institute. Now, you were on the board of trustees at the uh, Shawnee, is that right. correct? How long were you there? Well, that's what I was saying. It started with the vocational school. Just merged right into when it, when it merged with the technical institute, merged in with the Ohio University Board. Then it became Shawnee State General, Shawnee State General Technical College. Then it became Shawnee State Community College. Then July 1st, July 2nd, it was 86th. Mr. Ferguson, all the first. Great person here. Passed away recently. Yeah, he was a community officer, great man. One of my best friends. He was here for 23 years, but I was 24. He always said, Well, I'm going to catch you one of these days. But, uh, no, I'm very proud of it because that's. that's no money involved. Let me ask you this. Uh, I, on these tapes, I tried to establish a genealogical line because I figured somebody would be interested someday. Uh, what were your parents' names? Uh, Francis Edward Highland, and he was married. My mother name was Rhonda, L I N A, and my name was Sims. S I M S I M S. S I M S. Where was she from? Uh, well, that in, in the same general area, uh, uh, my, my dad uh, originally came up around the Franklin Furnace. I think my mother was from around uh, the Franklin Furnace over in Orange County. What were your father's parents' names? You didn't know they were test. Well, let's see. See, the thing of it is, uh, John, just when you ask that, the things at the point was shows you how much your parents' religion and politics influence you. Uh, and as you know, all the highlands of the Franklin Furniture are the Catholic city. 
Big job, I think, is probably when I invented it by the other I knew him from high school, I knew him from high school, and that he was a dog. Did you attend Green High School? No, it's all in the South. It's all in the South. But uh, just to show you, my dad was seven years of age, and uh, his mother made the name of Pyle. Well, the oldest one is Todd, the next one is Tyler, and 
entire Dixie, and Mike's son of David, Mike Dixie, and Mike is my Michael Dixie. Keep that in there. But anyway, Tim's kids are you know, Todd and Kevin, and Tyler Dixie, and Trent Corey, and the daughter is Tess Tyler. Are any of them there? Todd. Todd, Todd, and he's got the boy. Uh, now, uh, do you remember, uh, where were you when uh, Oral Harbor was? Right in the middle of the bridge between between Newport uh, and the Where is it? Where is it? You must have heard it on the radio. I right did. Uh, Helen and her parents read the same lessons. We didn't know what happened to me. I don't know whether it's Fort Mitchell or anyway, but it was an army team right across the river. There's a Fort Thomas down there. Fort Thomas, I think it was. I think it was Fort Thomas. We'd go into the trust. He had he had gone into the into this army. Oh, early the, the night, uh, okay. And uh I got the thing right on you. He might have been in uh like October or four or something. Okay. I'm not sure about that. So you're up, you're in a bridge headed yeah. towards Cincinnati. Well, we're, we're coming home. We're coming home. Scene, uh-huh. And we're we're right. <laughs> there's a river down there. And I heard you're suspended over the Ohio River. And I can I can remember if I'm not mistaken. I, I heard President Roosevelt make that famous statement. Mm-hmm. This day this day to live in the you know. Um, what what did you think when that happened, Pearl Harbor? Did you want to know well, where is that? Well, that's right. right. You know. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is. I mean, uh, you know, it just uh, it just came with such a shock, I guess, to everybody. It, uh, it wasn't any question about the, the country. And uh, as time went on, banding together to fight, to, fight, uh, to uh, you know, to uh, come up with a good war effort. Uh, war bond drives and all that sort of thing, you know. But I don't know exactly what I thought at the time. I guess it's mm-hmm. so. You, you, uh, but you uh, eventually then you joined the Navy, and uh, uh, did you like the Navy? By the way, did you like the Navy? Okay. Then, did you keep in touch with any of your friends from that period of time? Mm-hmm. Well, one of my best friends. One of my best friends was a, was a Jewish fellow named Herbert Greenspan. He never, he never went to the name of Herbert. He, he always knew he was paid. And he was the same age as my brother. He was nine years old. He, he was single. He was from Uniontown, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and I met him when we were on the train going from the Great Lakes to San Diego. And in fact, at the time when all we we both went to X-ray school. We went to the school. We went to X-ray school. We went to the Oakland Naval Hospital. And uh, when I went to Whidbey Island Naval, Naval Air Station, from Oakland, I think he went to the independent duty someplace. Mm-hmm. But he was from Uniontown, and prior to him entering the service, he was a he was a uh, feature writer for the Uniontown Daily Newspaper. <coughs> How I met him was uh, we were we were sitting three to three to a seat in that train, and the chief came through and he says, uh, <coughs> "Any heart players here?" And I remember Babe said, "I don't want to get involved in that." Any heart players? Heart hearts. Hearts. He said, I don't want to. Get, I don't want to get involved in that. Well, the chief came through about three different. Said, "Need another, another heart player." Finally, he gets up, and I had just met him. And he said, Here, and he said, uh, Keep my bill for me. He said, I got a couple hundred dollars. I'm, I'm going to take 50 bucks with me. I don't want to take it out and pull that money with me. I said, Okay, so I got in. I didn't have fun. That evening, he came back about 5 30. He said, Okay, I'll have to get how much money he comes in. Put this in bill for me. He said, I'll Book of the next morning. <laughs> he had one. He yeah. He won every, we was on that train three days to San Diego. And I remember when, uh, when they called Muster, which called him the Roll of Guys, what they called Muster, you know. Going alphabetically in there, guys answering up, you know, the chief. Greenspan. Yeah. He hesitated and he said, 
I want to take him back with me so he even got the check. <laughs> he was a good arts player. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of them is the same again. When we were up at Oakland, yeah. uh, when we were up at Oakland, California, there was a racetrack in uh, south there. I forget what the name was. But uh, when that racetrack would open, I'd see old baby studying the racing forms, you know. He won't always want to be with him. I said, I don't want to go. But he'd win. He'd mm-hmm. play there for some reason. He'd win. And uh, he remembered the Elks. You know, he three or four times he took me to them. The Elks came. Mm-hmm. They had a great nation of Elks. But he's probably, he was, he was probably my closest friend uh, after the war. And uh, how long I lived traveling. And I was talking to the town. I called the newspaper. So that in fact we had that, we had lunch with him. But uh, I don't know what's happened. His parents his parents owned a hotel there in Unitown. And uh, during the during the time he was in the Navy, he said his parents had gone down to Fort Lauderdale or someplace. And, and but he told me one time he said there's, that, there's, there's not any uh, the Greenspan, there's not any more Greenspan. Well, that's not quite right. Alvin Greenspan, you know, big, and a big, big name. You know, I, I, when Alvin and I don't know, we, we, about 20 some years, we've gone to Pompano Beach, which is right north, north of Fort Lauderdale. I'd look at the phone book, you know, and I'd see several Greenspan. And I'd been tempted to call, but there was nothing, none in there that said H. Greenspan. So I don't know, I don't know where he's still living or not. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say or talk about? You got any tattoos you want to talk about? No, no. I didn't get any tattoos. I'm telling you. <laughs> young people today, I, I saw a kid walking up the street down in Sony here. Oh, that looks strange. He had his shirt off and he had tattoos all over his back. Um, I thought, I think I'll keep my shirt on. Piercing their ears and oh, their noses no, and tongues and everything else. Strange. Well, listen, Dave, thanks a lot. Appreciate right. it very much. I don't know whether that's what you're working on. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've got you in our video archives now. Yeah, okay. This will be on the, the uh, show for the Portsmouth Public Library. Right. Well, I tell you, you, you asked me if I like the Navy. I tell young people today, if a, any young person wants to come into the military service with the right attitude, the opportunity is there. So what for the people? Matter of fact, Trent, Tim's uh, Tim's third son, mm-hmm. he's, he's going into, uh, I guess, the Army National Guard, and he's been going now for, I think, uh, I think a couple months, I'm going to take a weekend. Is this his basic? Yeah, but the second of November, he goes to Stillwater, Oklahoma, mm-hmm. I can't think of the port, Portsville. Still water. Fort Sill. Fort Sill, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's when he'd be out there. And when he finishes there, he'd go down to Texas someplace. Mm-hmm. But he's, I got a mind. And I, that's what I told him. I said, Tim, for Trent, you have the right attitude. Because he, he, he's, he's an intelligent boy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, if, you know, he might as well take advantage of those, uh, those military schools that you have. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it helped my boy a lot. That's right. You know, and, uh, he's got all his tuition paid. He's going to Ohio University. He's in the National Guard. The National Guard. Well, that's one hundred percent. That's what. That's what Trent so He knew that. He, he was, I, I don't know how. Uh, well, I guess I do know. Now Tyler, the second one, he got a degree in uh, computer and electrical engineering technology. He's got a good job. I mean, Trent's been working with him. Trent was going to change his major. He got all help on sports management. I said, where are you going to go? Where are you going to get a job after you finish it? So then uh, this outfit, he's tired of working for him. For Trent's going to, he got a two buck an hour raise here a couple of years ago. And he's, he's been out on his own. I don't think mean, it's uh, called Advantage Data Systems. And, uh, but they, they, he and Tyler go all over the place. Really? Where they get to. And they, they make up software stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, that, that's a future. I stick, stick, stick with it. He said, well, I think I'm going to get, when I get through this military stuff, so I'll move back into it. Because he was doing real good in that program. I think he does have a right. Right. Okay. 
Well, thanks a lot. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Who else is coming in? I think Leo. Leo Blackburn's going to be. Leo? Oh, he'll be a good one. Okay.